television highlights of the news of yesteryear. They also serve at the White House, Washington. It's 1933, and there's new tenant in nation's executive mansion. Head of the house is Franklin Roosevelt, 31st president of the United States. But FDR is not at all alone. Among his White House crew are Ed Starling, Secret Service advance man, and Frank Dalrymple, captain of the White House police. His crews protect the president when he's home. Here's presidential chauffeur Francis Robinson. And this is Dick Jarvis, who since 1908 has ridden with our presidents as chief of White House Secret Service men. And here's J. May White, doorman and barber at the executive mansion, who has shaved every president since William Howard Taft. He's opening the door for Ike Hoover, who was chief usher and major domo of White House for quarter century. Chief of White House telegraphers in 1933 is Doc Smithers. Day he went to work, he flashed news to America that battleship Maine was sunk in Havana Harbor. This is not just an ordinary telephone girl. She's Louise Hoffmeister, top telephone operator at White House switchboard. Here's call she took in 1933. Mr. Kelly. Um, Mr. Farley would like to talk with Mr. with the president. Miss Thompson isn't around right now. I think she might be busy with Mrs. Roosevelt. I wonder if I can call you back in a few minutes. And here's a man whose name is almost as well known as the president he serves. He's White House Secretary Stephen Early, former newsman. And here are some of the members of Franklin Roosevelt's famous Brain Trust. This is Professor Rexford Tugwell president's advisor on farm and labor problems in America. Leading member of early day brain trusters, Raymond Moley, also a one-time professor. I assist the president in matters of general governmental policy. I hunt for the best advisors and bring the advice that they have to offer in the best form possible to the president. Among earliest of Roosevelt's political advisors is Adolf Burley, Jr. He says of his job, A lawyer is an intellectual jobber and contractor. A part of his equipment, if he handles business questions, has to be some knowledge of finance and economics as well. Either officially or unofficially, he can sometimes be of use to an administration. And here's Lewis Howe, long a friend of Roosevelt and long his guide and advisor on the road to the White House. As one who knew Franklin Roosevelt through the years, Howe says, I should say, as I have surveyed this situation, that the spare time of the secretary to the president is just about sufficient to allow him to go out and have a good game of golf every other year. And last, but just as important a figure as all the rest, is Gus Jennering, Roosevelt's personal bodyguard. And he says, I am the president's personal bodyguard. I go where he goes. I have been with him the past four years while he was the governor of New York State. I want to say that anybody who has no business with him Better look out. And believe me, I don't mean maybe. Seventy-five and up. It's August 1927 at a Deering Oaks, Maine, Air's Convention of Americans over 75 years old. As at all conventions, there are contests. And what can grandmothers and great-grandmothers do better than knit a few rows while their husbands are spinning a few yarns of another sort? The game is even older than the ancient players, and this aging couple are checker mates, both born many years before the Civil War. 
Maybe she's old, but she has young ideas and habits. And here's the high point of the convention of aged couples. The torrid footwork of 1927 didn't look like this, but what they did at Deering Oaks this August day was daring enough for the old folks having fun. Here in 1920 is Admiral Robert Edwin Perry, famed Arctic explorer and naval officer. In 1908, Perry dog-teamed over land and ice-clogged waters to reach the North Pole. These are last pictures of famed American. For February 20th, 1920, he died. Here's Irene Langhorn in 1920. Who's Irene Langhorn? Well, in 1895, she became wife of artist Charles Dana Gibson and was model for his original painting of a now famed Gibson girl. Yes, here's the original Gibson girl as she looked way back in 1920. The cowboy is Tris Speaker, sometimes known as one of greatest ball players of all time. It's 1920 and Speaker's home in Texas for Rodeo after leading Cleveland Indians to first pennant win in history. Tris Speaker. South Wind. It's 6th of April, 1936. And here's just a small section of countryside in six southern states that took brunt of blasting winds as tornadoes twisted through Southland causing untold destruction, injury, and death. Here's street scene in one Georgia town after funnel furrowed through. Here's one of the victims, and here's some who were lucky. Walls withered before burst of wind. Big buildings were ripped open. Surviving livestock survey ruins which lie twisted and torn all around them, and people who survived stand around in dazed condition. After the fury of the storm, bursting fires add to the suffering and peril. Stricken towns are mere tinder boxes now, with matters made worse by congested water mains. Days later, when score is tallied, 300 are known to be injured, scores killed, and property damage is in millions. It's one of worst storms Southland ever saw. Wonderful 101. It's December 25th, 1923, and posing for sculptor in Los Angeles is former Senator Cornelius Cole. A member of the graduating class of Wesleyan in 1847, Cole doesn't look it, but he's exactly 101 years old. If you can't believe it, there's his son, a youngster of 68. for transport. It's 1923, and at Dayton, Ohio, Army Signal Corps prepares to test the T-1 Martin bomber, redesigned for conversion into plane for passengers. It's first of kind to fly. Weighing 11,700 pounds, it takes off with one dozen passengers and crew of three. Built for war, it's remodeled to fly route of peace. On maiden journey, it glides over Dayton at top speed of 106 miles an hour. Perfect posture, 1920 style. In 1920, it wasn't so much what you wore, but how you stood up under it. Posture must be perfect. So at Boston Normal School, Ms. Ruth Irving demonstrates the posture perfect in a delightful suit of dazzling long underwear. But first she shows how not to take your stand. And now with Rosalind Brown shoulders looking on in admiration, Ms. Irving demonstrates how to be upstanding and get a bid from Notre Dame. Channel swimmer, Hudson River style. It's 1st of September, 1925. And Johnny Freckles Devine, six years old, 
leaps into Hudson River and starts paddling for the New Jersey shore. He's recently done the Delaware from bank to bank, and now he's hiking across the Hudson with the mastery of a tow-headed minnow. Even in shallow waters, he swims to conquer. And when it's all over, he gets congratulation from crowd and rub down from Johnny Freckles Sr. September in the rain, it's September 22nd, 1933. And on steps of New York City Hall, Mayor O'Brien greets city heroes. Mayor of the city of New York, I feel particularly happy today in greeting you and extending to you the felicitation of seven millions of our citizens. And here's former manager McGraw. I hope the bill will be successful in the World Series <clears throat> and bring the championship back to New York. Thank you. Current manager Bill Terry says, I don't know of any time in my life and I've had more of a thrill than I have of winning this pennant. And I sincerely hope that we can come back from Washington as world champions. Would you like for me to introduce some of the boys to you? Yeah. 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 Here's Al Schumacher. Say hello. Hello, everyone. Mellot. Hello, folks. Here's Blondie Ryan. Yeah. 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 They can't beat us. Ryan. Yeah. 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 Carl Hubble. <laughs> 